Today, we'll be learning about virtual reality training, more specifically, behavioral skills training in VR. By the end of the presentation, you should be able to answer the question on your screen. Like, what is VR and what is AI? How are they being used in trainings? What is behavioral skills training? What are the benefits of implementing behavioral skills training in VR? And what do researchers know about virtual reality training? And here are the topics that we'll be covering. First, I'll be giving you a short introduction about myself. And AI. And we'll tie everything together with VR training. Additionally, throughout the presentation, there will be checkpoint questions where I give you three to five seconds to answer on your own. These are designed to help you with your quiz. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Anne. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and ta. I was born in Taiwan and I moved to California when I was eight. I graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in psychology, and I'll be graduating from CSUN this year with a master's in applied behavior analysis. I am currently working as a research assistant in Dr. Kazemi's K-Lab, where I get to put my love for video games to work. I believe, and just like other people in lab, we believe that technologies like video games can be educational and fun and exciting. The reason why I liked video games so much is because when I first came to the US, I didn't speak any English. And the only word that I knew was egg. And it took me about six months before I was able to hold a basic conversation with my friends. And one reason I was able to learn so quickly was because I wasn't allowed to play video games unless I was able to follow along and know what's happening without my mom translating for me. So I was really motivated to learn English. Then later in college, I realized that the video games I played were more than just rewards for studying. The different types of games that I played helped me learn English and study how people talk to each other. For instance, Toontowns have pre filled chat bubbles, which taught me common English phrases that people would say to each other. And the, in Diablo 2, there were narrated cinematics at the end of each level. So I had early versions of audiobooks um, when I was trying to learn English. And then with League of Legends, I wrote a lot of my psych papers on how online gaming nowadays promotes a lot of social en engagement, especially for engagements of people across the world. And when I graduated from college, my love for video games helped me with work too. When I first graduated, one of my first jobs was a behavioral therapist. Um, I worked with people with disabilities to teach them life skills to help them be more successful in their um, community and their homes. With one of my students, I needed to teach her how to cross the street when there was no cars. And in the past, when we tried practicing in real life, there are multiple times where she almost stepped out into traffic when there were cars coming. Uh, as you can see, it's really, really dangerous. So I talked to my supervisor and we decided that we're gonna take a pause on practicing in person and we're gonna do a little bit role play with toys um, at home, just so that she understands if there's a car, you don't cross the street. After about a week of practicing at home, we noticed that, hey, she was stopping her dolls um, at the curb where when there's a car. So. We, were, we thought, hey, maybe she's ready to practice again in person. Unfortunately, when we brought her out into the community again to cross the street, she almost stepped on into traffic. Um, everybody was safe. She was fine. We blocked her. Um, and we pretty much put that whole program on pause again. And this time, when we were trying to problem solve to figure out what we can do to overcome this challenge, um, I suggested to my supervisor that maybe playing video games might be helpful. 
my student already plays video games on her iPad and she's pretty really good with rhythm games where she has to recognize when something was coming. So I figure that maybe playing games, playing games like Crossy Roads um, would help her better grasp when to cross the street. So we did that. We did that for a week. And when we were um, seeing that she was progressing pretty well in the games, we decided let's try again crossing the street in the community in person. And it was really exciting to see that after just a week of playing the video games and having um, talking about um, how crossing the street works and why you shouldn't cross the street when there's a car, um, when we practiced in person, she did not cross the street when there was a per, um, when there was a car. Instead, she stopped, said there was a car, and waited for the car to pass, or waited for the people in the car to stop fully before she crossed the street with her mom. It was very fun to watch her progress um, over over the course of the month, and. Since then, I've been really interested in how video games and other technologies can really help us overcome these learning challenges that we face. Within a year, I applied for CSUN's master's program um, for applied behavior analysis because I wanted to learn more about how people learn in general and what are other tools that I can be using to make learning more effective and more efficient for the students I was working with. And through the program, that's where I met Dr. Kazemi, where um, I started working with all my loving, nerdy research family who, again, like I said, are all interested in using technology to help people learn. And here's what we've learned through our research. Throughout history, technology has been a major player in helping people learn. For instance, before the printing press, not many people had books, so most people didn't learn how to read. But once the printing press was uh, invented, more and more people learned how to read. And likewise, before internet existed, people had to do research by either flipping through a lot of physical books or doing a lot of experiments. But now that internet exists, research can happen a lot faster and the things that we learn from research we can pass it on to other scientists from across the world within seconds so technology really really helps us improve the way we learn and make us much more efficient at learning it's really no wonder why hollywood and many other people believe that one day technology is going to be so amazing that for us to learn or gain any new information, we just have to plug ourselves into the computer and download the information. Here's exhibit A, the matrix. Jiu -jitsu. I'm going to learn Jiu -jitsu. Yeah, so Neo decided that he wanted to learn jujitsu, plugged himself into a computer and downloaded not just jujitsu, but a bunch of other martial arts. And here's exhibit B, Lucy. For those of you who haven't seen the movie and want to watch the movie, I'm really sorry about the spoiler I'm about to share, but it's, it's important for the point I'm trying to make. So in the movie, Lucy pretty much gets this drug and becomes really, really smart, really, really fast and unlocks 100% of her brain power. And by the end of the movie, 
she is so good at learning information that she literally became a USB. This metaphor is super, super on the nose. And it makes sense. A lot of people want to plug ourselves in and download their information and move on with our lives. Now we kind of have an idea of what Hollywood and a lot of people think technology and human learning will look like in the future. Let's take a look at what scientists actually believe. So the question is, is learning passively our future? Unfortunately, all of us, passive learning is not how people learn. So this is what scientists have learned. When it comes to gaining knowledge and learning things, there's knowing and then you have doing. Passive learning works for rote memorization of information, but when it comes to learning how to perform an actual task, which includes applying the instructional material to novel context, active listening is our best bet. In other words, unlike Neo from The Matrix, passive learning to a lecture on how to do jujitsu can help us ace a multiple choice test on a different types of jujitsu moves. But if we're planning to win an Olympic medal with jujitsu, we actually have to practice. There's no going around that. No shortcuts. Okay, our first checkpoint. Which of the following can you teach using passive learning? A, hold the chopstick the right way. B, knowing that mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. C, solving the quadratic equation by hand. Or D, rolling on the floor when you're on fire. I'm gonna give you five seconds. Time's up. The right answer is C. B is the only answer that involves learning a piece of information. The other choices involves learning how to do something. Okay, now we talk about some ways we can improve learning. Number one, mix and match your learning strategies. Passive and active learning is really not an either or option. Different people have different learning histories, which means they have preferences on how they learn. So sometimes you just have to mix things up in order to create individualized learning opportunities. And if you're teaching a group, that's more of a reason why you should include both passive and active learning so that you can meet the needs of all of your students. Okay, number two. Make it fun and reinforcing. In multiple studies, when students were asked which they like more, more students said that they prefer passive learning over active learning, even though when students who underwent active learning did better on the exams at the end. Researchers think that students like active learning less compared to passive learning because active learning requires more work than passive learning. So does that mean passive learning is more fun for students since they say it, they like it more? No. Nope. Teachers in the study have reported that students are not really interested in passive learning. And a lot of times they actually fall asleep during the class. So what does the research actually say? Well, research has shown that reinforcement learning is a process that people learn the best and also how we maintain a lot of our skills. So what do you do when your student need motivation to engage with the learning materials? Well, you really have to get creative. Find ways to make your materials thought-provoking, digestible, and applicable. You can do so by using different medias like pictures and videos. And if you're in person, you can even have physical activities to get people moving around while you're learning the lesson. And number three, practice and actually practice the skills. So researchers have found that meaningful engagement in the instructional material are crucial for learning. If it's a physical skill you're trying to learn, you have to do the behavior. 
watching it, observing it sometimes isn't enough. Actually, most of the time isn't enough. And what this means is if you intend to perform an emergency surgery, you have to actually practice surgery itself, not just watch Grey's Anatomy. Or something like this might happen. Check his mouth. Check his mouth. There's nothing okay. in there. All right, so let's lay him down. Sir, just relax. Everything will be just fine. Let me get his head back. Okay. Sterilization, hot water. Do you know what you're doing? Technically, you're doing technically no, but I've been I've been doing some research and I feel fairly confident I know how. Fairly confident. Oh, Jesus. Wow, okay. Let's do a little bigger. Wow, okay. It goes in deeper than I thought. I'm going to insert my... Now, if you just one moment, you're going to feel the oxygen flow into your brain. That's there we go. That's oxygen. Jesus oh. Christ. You probably could have just pulled a piece of pancake out of his throat. Can you do it? You know you're not a real doctor, right? Yeah, neither are you. Okay. Yeah, bye-bye. You're a reckless you person. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Not you. Sorry, we can't just perform surgeries like that without actual proper training and practice. Okay, moving on to number four. Okay, number four is pretty much do number three on repeat. The learning process is really just try, fail, and try again. So get comfortable with making mistakes because making mistakes is how we learn, which takes us to number five, learning from feedback. Mistakes and failures are corrective feedback. It tells you when something isn't right, which then gives you the opportunity to do something different. And of course, not all feedback have to be corrective. Feedback can also come in the form of what you're doing well. You can know that you're right or wrong in a couple of ways. You can have someone tell you directly that something went right or wrong. And this is what we call socially mediated contingencies. Or you can have the consequence of your own actions give you the feedback. This is what we call natural contingencies. Um, as you can see from the picture, socially mediated contingencies are like the thumbs ups, the emotes, the likes, and the shares that you see on social media. And natural contingencies are more like if you don't put on sunscreen, you're going to get sunburned. You experiencing the sunburn is a natural contingency. And tells you that, hey, maybe the next time you're out under the sun, you should put sunscreen on. Actually, definitely always put sunscreen on. Either way, they're both feedback and they're both really important for learning. And here's a couple tips, a couple more tips about giving and receiving feedback. So number one, it's not just any kind of feedback that works. Quality of the feedback really matters. When we receive specific and accurate feedback about what we can improve or keep doing, we are able to implement these feedbacks more effectively. And also, timing matters too. For new learners, immediate real-time feedback is great because they don't know what to do. And telling them step-by-step step is very helpful. But once you and I and whoever else is in the training has a general idea of how things work, then you want to save that feedback at the end of the practice so that there's less interruptions for them to practice a skill. And they're also able to quickly understand, okay, what is the general thing I need to work on the next time I practice this? Okay. Checkpoint number two, which of the following is an example of natural contingency? A, you get your food after you pay the meal. B, you receive a bonus after a year of hard work. C, your headache goes away after you take a medicine. Or D, you get a standing ovation after an excellent performance. Five seconds. Up. The right answer is C. All the other choices involve some other people 
let giving you the feedback. If you received a bonus at the end of your hard work, the bonus came from a person. Somebody had to, you know, put it in payroll and give that to you. So when somebody has to get involved in the process of letting you know something's right or wrong, that's socially mediated feedback. Okay, number three. Which of the following is an appropriate form of socially mediated feedback? Your backpack is a mess. B, fantastic job on your presentation. C, you did great, keep it up. Or D, thank you for cleaning all the food off of the dishes. Five seconds, go. Time's up. The right answer is D. It is specific about what was good and the other answers are just simply too vague. A is pretty much just a description. You're just telling somebody that what you have observed. But like, do you want them to clean it? I don't know. B and C are also too general. And if you are told that information, you don't exactly know what you're supposed to keep doing. What happens if you repeat the not so great part instead? So again, when it comes to feedback, be specific. Alrighty. And now that we know how people learn, let's talk about the trainings that pull all of the learning hacks to work. So you apply behavior analysis. We refer to behavioral skills training as the golden standard for training because it's a very effective teaching procedure for both children and adults with or without disabilities. So it pretty much works on everyone. And here's the four components of BST. Number one, you have instruction, which pretty much is lectures and general information about the skill, specific instructions on how to perform the task. It can be passive or active, depending on how you want to present your instructional material. Number two is modeling. You don't want to just tell people what to do. You want to show them what to do. And by showing them how to do the best practices, it increases the likelihood that your learner actually perform the skills the right way. And then you have number three, which is rehearsal. And rehearsal is just another way of saying practice. Practice, practice, practice. And last but not least, number four of the BSD is feedback, where trainers or whoever is teaching you something provides feedback to you to help you improve the practice portion. And what you do with BST is repeat that step three practice and step four feedback until the student meets target performance. Now, you might be wondering if behavioral skills training is based on all the scientific evidence and it's proven to work with diverse populations, then why aren't we using behavioral skills training more often? Well, that's a great question. Well, BST has a lot of advantages, but the advantages actually acts as its weakness as well. For instance, rehearsal and feedback take a lot of time for that whole practice and feedback, practice and feedback until you're really good at something. And also in order to provide high quality feedback for the learner, we need an expert trainer and have small training groups so that everyone gets a chance to practice and get feedback. And when you combine the high demand with a small supply, these trainings end up being really expensive. Furthermore, even if we're able to overcome the financial barriers and increase the number of trainings, trainers can sometimes make small errors during the training. This is what we call trainer drift. And these small errors can eventually snowball into different training styles, which cause people to have different qualities of training. And that's not very good. You want everybody to come out from the training with the same level of performance. You want everyone to pass, right? Okay, so checkpoint four. Why is behavior skills training not widely used? A. BSC requires too many steps to implement. 
or B, BSP does not work well with large groups of people or C, not many people know about BST or how to implement it or D, behavioral skills training only works with people with disabilities. I'm gonna give you five seconds while you answer. Okay, time's up. The right answer is B. Behavioral skills training is meant to be individualized experience and depends on the learner getting quality feedback from expert trainers. So you definitely need that small group so everyone gets a chance to practice. And then the other answers are just not true. Okay, number four virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Okay. When most people think of VR, a lot of time they're just thinking of entertainment, right? You got V Saber and there's roller coasters where you can wear the headsets and you're now in a, you're still riding the roller coaster, but now you're having a whole different experience, which I really wish I could go. I just wish this pandemic is over so I could do that. Well, Anyways, while they're really, really entertaining, you can do so much more with virtual reality. So let's talk about virtual reality. The term virtual reality is by definition an umbrella term for all virtual environments. The best part of virtual environments is that almost anything is possible. For training, this means that you can create any type of practice environment that you want. So remember my case that I mentioned earlier where she needed to cross the street? If I had the technology and the coding skills, I could have created a virtual environment where she could have practiced crossing the street with virtual cars. In that way, she can experience crossing the street without anybody needing to worry that she might get hurt. These virtual environments can be displayed on different screens and monitors, and sometimes even projected onto walls. So again, virtual reality is a really broad term. And depending on how they're presented, virtual reality can be somewhere between non-immersive and fully immersive. With non-immersive VR, you can see your natural environment, but with fully immersive VR, you can only see the virtual environment. How immersive virtual reality is, it's not an either or, it's a spectrum. And if you're wondering where does AR fall in between non-immersive and fully immersive, things like AR where you're able to see the virtual environment on top of our natural environment that would fall right in the center of non-immersive and fully immersive. If you're going to create a training using technology, you really want to think about your target audience. How immersive do they need the training to be? And can my target audience handle the technology? The most immersive virtual reality is not required to achieve successful training performances. Okay, checkpoint time number five. What is the major difference between immersive and non-immersive VR? Okay. You cannot see the real world with immersive VR. B, you have to use the controllers for immersive VR or C, you can physically move around in immersive VR, or D, you can use voice chat with immersive VR. What is it? You get five seconds to figure it out. Okay, time is up. The right answer is A. As of right now, immersiveness is more about the things you're seeing. Of course, in the future, when our technology um, gets even fancier, where haptic devices are going to be the next cool thing, in those situations, in the definition of immersiveness might change. But as of right now, when people talk about immersiveness, they're really talking about the things that you're seeing. All right. 
Now let's talk about artificial intelligence. For those of you who may not be familiar with what artificial intelligence is, a great fictional example of AI is Jarvis from Iron Man. Jarvis, you there? At your service, sir. Gauge heads up display. Check. Report all preferences from home interface. Will do, sir. So yeah, Jarvis is highly, highly sophisticated in, it, in its design and can do a lot of things that we wish um, our Alexa, Siri, and Google could do for us. But not all AIs are created equal. Most of the AIs are actually less sophisticated than Jarvis, but they're still all game changers in terms of how they help us in our daily lives. So in video games, AIs are used for non-player characters or NPCs. And even when you're not interacting with these characters in the games, they're still doing off doing their own thing, pretty much like real people. And Google uses AI to help you find where you want to go faster and also help you find the most relevant searches that when you're Googling information. And what would we do without our Alexas and Siri and Google Assistants? All right, quick recap on what an AI is. An AI is pretty much a computer program that attempts to replicate human intelligence. It's trying to mimic how humans solve problems, make decisions, and learn. Think about machine learning. AIs can be programmed to be either 100% dependent on human input, or it can be fully automatic. A more sophisticated AI typically have a higher levels of autonomy which enables them to think and make decisions without direct input from humans. Less sophisticated AIs, on the other hand, needs, need the humans to make some levels of decision in order for, to proceed with an action. Again, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Think about that before trying to decide, man, how much money do I want to throw down to code for a functioning AI? Okay, checkpoint number six. Which of the following is true about an AI? A, you can consider any computer program as an AI. B, you can only program an AI to do basic tasks. Or C, you can use AI for a variety of purposes. Or D, you can find an AI in virtual worlds, but not in real life. Five seconds. Go. Stop. The right answer is C. Engineers are able to program an AI to do a lot of things. Remember the previous slides, right? You've got Pokemon NPCs, you have Alexa, you have Siri, you have Google Maps. There's so many things that AIs can do for us and are already doing for us. So when you mix AI with training, there's a lot of exciting things that you can do. You can have the AI be virtual patients that doctors and therapists practice with. You can have AI trainers who provide the perfect amount of challenge and expert feedback for, to your trainings. And by including AI in trainings, we can potentially make trainings much, much more accessible by taking human trainers out of the equation. Now, we're not trying to replace human trainers. Human trainers actually spend time researching and figuring out what are other ways that they can improve, improve the training experience. All right. Like I said, we talked about VR and we talked about AI and now let's push them together and combine all the benefits to technology have to create virtual reality trainings. 
there's a lot of reasons why virtual reality trainings are amazing and super groundbreaking. And, and the first reason is that virtual reality trainings lets people get ahead on the practice so that they can, they are competent and comfortable to work on day one of the job. There's not enough access to safe healthcare because we don't have enough surgeons trained. We are so excited about the Oculus Quest and it's simple. You want your residents at the first time they touch a patient to be really ready for that moment. And that's what virtual reality has allowed us to do. This is amazing, right? No more learning on the job. You should know what to do by the time you start your job. And then reason two. VR trainings let you have hands-on experience. Remember active learning? Yeah, VR lets you do that. Order, you know, hearing about it versus, you know, seeing it and doing it is totally different. This is like hands-on training. This kind of training that helps with making it faster because once you hit the floor with this, you know what you're doing. It makes people want to learn more. Hands-on training is important for customer service, which is everything. This enhancement would unify the company. See? See? Okay. Now, reason three. You want to practice skills as closely to the real thing as possible, but sometimes it's just too dangerous. And with VR trainings, you can practice the dangerous situation without actually getting hurt. No one should be dying from the training car accidents in all different sorts of fire. scenes repetitively. Mm -hmm. so, so just explain, Carl's now got the, the mask on. Mm -hmm. He, and we're going to, I think, be able to see what he's seeing. Yeah. Um, oh, no. So just if you could, OK. That's so, a big plane So fire. this situation of a, a, of a plane fire. on fire, um, how, how, explain how oh, helpful... Way. Wow. Gee whiz. Gee <laughs> whiz is right. Okay, before we continue um, listing out all the great thing about virtual reality, here's another checkpoint. Which example shows how virtual reality keeps you safe during a practice? A, new employees learning how to make KFC chickens in VR. B, teachers learning how to teach a class using VR. Or C, nurses learning how to empathetically talk to their VR patients. Or D, children learning how to cross the street. Five seconds, go. Okay. And the right answer is Crossing the street can be really dangerous. Hence the story I mentioned earlier. And VR training using VR environments can take all of the risk away. All right. And now the fourth reasons why, uh, the fourth reason why virtual reality training is great. So some of these trainings are really, really well designed and they evoke a lot of real emotional responses. It can definitely be very scary depending on the situation, but this is good because if the worst case scenario happens, you want to know that you can really handle it and you're not going to freeze on the job. The Verizon store in Reston, Virginia. It was emotional. It was traumatic in a lot of ways. It was raw. Uh, it was just like awakening of what more I could be doing in my role to take that education piece and what happens day to day back to my team. Yep, Verizon pretty much had their frontline staff get trained on what do you do when somebody's trying to rob the store? And of course, that is a worst case scenario. The best part about virtual reality is that you can have so many different practice scenarios that your employees or your students face on the daily basis. And here is an example of Hilton using virtual reality use this tool to be able to really help our team members practice different scenarios of building empathy with our guests and make sure that we are delivering best in class service. Yeah. Look at that. Hilton has a lot of staff and they're able to quickly teach the staff to be kind and friendly so that when we go on vacations, we can 
have fun and enjoy ourselves. Oh, nice. Okay. And now reason six. In addition to all the different scenarios, what might be more important is that you can capture the rare situations where training probably matters the most. Um, again, people need to practice in order to learn and maintain a skill. So for the rare situations where you can't really just practice in real life, you can now do it in VR. And pay attention to this video. It includes an example of what one scenario might look like in a VR training. Also, the content might be a little uncomfortable for some people. Have you guys go ahead and put the headsets back on. The Chicago PD is now piloting a new program, one that uses virtual reality to train for these delicate situations. Here we go. I strap in and I'm put in the shoes of an officer approaching someone experiencing a mental health crisis. What's going on? Specifically, schizophrenia. Hey, partner, he's got a screwdriver. The scene freezes, and I'm given two options for what my character should say. Can we talk or drop it now? Watch what happens when I choose drop it now, the more aggressive choice. Drop the screwdriver! No. Drop no, it now! Throw it down! Yeah, yeah, it Kyle, drop violence. the screwdriver now! Throw it to the side! Oh, Sir, get inside! The scene escalates, and my character is given a choice. Taser. Kyle, if you don't drop it, I'm going to tase you! Or firearm. Get inside the house! Drawing a weapon at all only further intensifies the situation. Kyle! Throw it to the side! Now! Experts say this kind of hair trigger tension could mean the difference between tragedy and a peaceful outcome. Kyle! Get down on your knees. Now watch what happens when I choose, can we talk? Uh, Kyle, listen, listen, ago, I want to talk to you, but I need you to put that, that screwdriver down, down first. Put Kyle, up. put that screwdriver down. Just toss it to the they're side for me. You don't get to see the ending of the video, but pretty much the police or the virtual police was able to de-escalate the situation and nobody gets hurt. So yeah, this is a really, really relevant improvement to trainings, especially for the police. Okie dokie, checkpoint number eight, we're almost done. So why are feelings important in virtual reality trainings? A, so that you can have a memorable training experience. Two, so that you can feel less bored in the trainings. Or C, so that you can pretend that you're in a video game or D, you can practice and learn to be empathetic. Okay, five seconds to think about the answer. And the right answer is... Yeah. While, a, while answers A, B, and C are probably correct, it's not the most important reason why VR trainings uh, evoking strong emotions is helpful to trainings. There's a lot of talk on social media about learning to be empathetic and understanding other people's perspectives. And with VR trainings, it has all the potential for letting people actually walk a mile in somebody else's shoes or imagine themselves what they would do in the worst case scenarios. It's very exciting stuff. And now back to all the reasons why VR trainings are awesome. Reason number nine. And this is sort of related to um, reason number eight, except this time it's more about geological barriers instead of the limited practices uh, or practice opportunities. Um, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's not about opportunities being rare, but sometimes it's about not being able to be physically present at the place where you would need to practice a skill. For instance, computer skills, but this is the program's main attraction. 360 degree videos get the inmates comfortable with the headsets and show them how much the world has changed. Why don't we try uh, self-checkout? Now I'm going to show you how to check out of a grocery store and pay for the groceries you're buying using self-checkout. And the store trusts the people like that? Yeah, they, they do. You know, there's often sometimes someone standing around, but uh, by and large, yeah. You will scan and bag your groceries yourself, unless... So yeah, it's really important for people in prison to be able to 
understand what has changed outside of the prison and start practicing ways that they can um, ease themselves back into the community when they're able to leave the prison system. And by having these practices, they're likely to reduce the um, amount of culture shock pretty much when they first leave prison, which a lot of times do end up bringing them back to the prison system. So VR's re virtual reality training can really, really help with prison reforms. And last but not least, number 10, virtual reality training is great because it can be used to help spread new information really, really quickly. So when COVID-19 hit, our frontline healthcare professionals were all suddenly thrown into the trenches of war. It was very important for them to get the latest information on how they can best protect themselves and their patients. Scientists in different parts of the world um, started using virtual reality to help disseminate all those important information as fast as possible and effectively because they're doing the action. And here's our last choke point before we say goodbye. Number nine, how does virtual reality trainings make learning opportunities more accessible? Is it A, individual training experiences, or B, overcome geological barriers, or C, increase interest in training, or D, provide more practice scenarios? Again, five seconds. And okay, time is up. The right answer is B, overcoming geological barriers. The other answers are still answers for why VR training is great, but they don't really explain how virtual reality make learning opportunities more accessible. And... We're done. Thank you so much for listening to the lecture. I hope you had a lot of fun. If you would like to see the references and the sources, uh, feel free to go on Dr. Kazemi's K-Lab website and the content will be there too. All right. Yeah. Excellent inspecting. This is good. You're, you're inspecting every piece. And you're doing a good job there, trainee. You sure are good at inspecting chicken. Yeah, that there does look like a good piece. Yeah, only the finest chicken. <coughs> it's uh, excellent inspecting. Let's keep going. <laughs>